Bonsoir et bienvenue à, à tous. Nous avons le grand plaisir ce soir euh, d'accueillir Patrick Ebicher, que, qui ne nécessite pas une longue euh, introduction. Vous savez comme moi euh, qu'il est notre voisin, puisque l'École Polytechnique fédérale de Lausanne a un siège à 500 mètres d'ici, même pas, euh, dans le campus euh, Biotech. Mais vous savez également que Patrick Ebicher est le président de cette école dans son siège à Lausanne, sur le lac de Genève, et que nous avons donc un double titre, le plaisir de l'accueillir ce soir dans ce petit établissement qui est très heureux de développer des relations avec l'École polytechnique fédérale. Patrick Ebicher a eu un parcours exceptionnel, médecin formé à Genève et à Fribourg. Il a enseigné pendant près d'une dizaine d'années à Brown University avant de passer à, au CHUV à Lausanne, puis de devenir président de l'IPFL en 2000, euh, fonction qu'il quittera à la fin de cette année après 16 ans de non seulement de bons et loyaux services, mais de services exceptionnels, euh, puisqu'il a présider, c'est la moindre des choses qu'on puisse attendre d'un président, à, à une expansion euh, tout à fait euh, remarquable de son établissement, mais une expansion qui a été en même temps euh, un très grand développement de qualité de cet établissement, puisque aujourd'hui, euh, l'EPFL, euh, qui a un budget euh, moitié moins grand que l'EPFZ, euh, récolte autant de financements compétitifs que son grand voisin. Donc c'est quelque chose de tout à fait remarquable que tout universitaire dans cette salle et tout ami des universités devrait se plaire à, à, comment dire, à souligner, puisque l'avenir de nos institutions passe très largement par l'obtention de ces financements compétitifs qui sont un, plus qu'un complément aujourd'hui à des finances publiques euh, promises à, à une légère stagnation euh, séculaire. Et donc, euh, c'est un grand plaisir pour nous de vous entendre, euh, Patrick, euh, sur euh, votre vision de, des transformations que la, la science apportera à notre monde et, et probablement euh, quelqu'un comme vous qui vient de, des sciences du vivant et a dir, dirigé une école d'ingénieurs est euh, parmi les mieux placés pour nous expliquer en quoi ce mariage euh, va produire un monde dans lequel il fera encore mieux vivre. Merci beaucoup. Bien, merci Philippe pour votre introduction. Oh, Est-ce que vous voulez que je parle en anglais ou en français En anglais, ok. Je ne savais pas. Donc, je vais changer en anglais si je ne sais pas. Donc, j'ai demandé de donner quelques highlights sur comment la science pourrait transformer le monde. Et, vous savez, une perspective de 2030, c'est très long pour la science, mais en même temps, je pense que nous pouvons commencer à imaginer ce qui va se passer. What's going to happen? So there are a couple of megatrends. You know, when we don't know exactly what's going to happen, we we talk about megatrends. And I think there's one that strikes me. In fact, that was the one that I've based, in fact, our strategy around. Is which is quite obvious. We're living in an interesting time where there's convergence between what I call info nano biocogno, meaning uh, convergence between information technology, nanotechnology, biotechnology, and cognitive science. And the consequence of this is that you have a deluge of data. We all speak and we hear about big data, but also we have the capacity of information theory to extract meaning uh, out of this big data. And that pr will profoundly change our society in the coming years. But I will also say something, but maybe I'm a bit biased, and I haven't lived sufficiently long, but I think the pace of technological de development have never been so fast which is also a problem because I think there's also, we will be faced with a capacity to in fact ingurgitate, to tolerate those changes that will become faster and faster. So 
I have four pr purposes. The first thing is we all agree is this digital revolution, robotics and additive manufacturing, the biological revolution. Those are the key points that are going on today. But also we're paying the past. And, and we're paying off today with climate change and potential, its potential consequences on food and water shortage, migration, and so on, probably, uh, to some extent, the way or our difficulty to handle the Industrial Revolution. And we shouldn't forget. On one side, what do you have to think that's going to go very fast, and on the other, you know, the, the macro elements not changing at the same pace. So what about the digital revolution? We all, we would agree that we're living in a hyper-connected world, populated more and more by what we call smart devices, biosensors, probably several of you have Fitbits and so on. They will become, you know, more numerous, nanorobots, creating, again, this gigantic amount of data. The other thing that strikes me, you know, we have been spoken, speaking about artificial intelligence for decades. And this was kind of a buzzword, but, you know, not very well considered. But this is changing. I think we see now, you know, very significant uh, progress in artificial intelligence. The Go example is a very good one. First, the chess, but Go, and I will not go to detail why the Go is interesting. But this is also, you know, frightening to some extent. And also a world, now to see on the good side, a world where access to education will be facilitated by uh, online technologies. To some extent, will live in a flatter world uh, in terms of access to information. So, you know a couple of numbers, which are, you know, mind-boggling when you think over 3 billion active internet users, 2.1 billion accounts on social networks, just Facebook, you know, which is close to 1.5 billion. Um, 200 billion emails per day. 1.8 billion pictures shared every day and three billion requests on Google every day. This is something that humanity has never seen. And not only in the developed world, but I think what is fascinating also, the developing world is catching up extremely quickly. And you could see that around 2025, you know, there will be more connected people in developing countries than in developed countries. Another thing, you know, just a couple of numbers, not too many, but this one is the one that I love is 90% of the data in the world has been created in the last two years alone. So now in 2025, we can expect 100 trillion zettabytes. Now, what is a zettabyte is 10 to the 21st. So it's 1 trillion. So we take about 100 zettabytes is 100 trillion gigabytes. This is, again, something never seen in humanity. And this is connectable and you can machine learn it, and I think, and you can data mine it. This is probably uh, the most fascinating. So you have a couple of examples. So where we go in science now is obsessed going from what we call big data to smart data. Of course, what the, the key element is smartification of data. And there's a, you know several examples. For example, from the twits, you know, prevention of epidemics, natural catastrophe, but also intelligent control society. Now we see the events, the terrible events of today, show that we still have progress to go to some extent. But this is something that will affect uh, our society. And coming back to this artificial intelligence, maybe something which is important, what I, that's what I call artificial intelligence-based data smartification. And this is something maybe, you know, that not a lot of people understand, but it's not that we've had new breakthrough theories, but it is just the progress of artificial intelligence is mostly due to the advent of big data. And this famous deep learning that we talk about is just what I call a dumb algorithm with lots of data beats um, a clever one with modest amounts of data. And this is, you know, something quite unusual. And it has shown some progress in errors such as chess, we've said translation, even though there's progress to be made, and again, the Google. Now, just you know, uh, Jean Pierre, 500 meters. As you know, we have a quite unique program called the Human Brain Project. It's a very ambitious where we try to see how far can we go in brain simulation uh, using the data accumulated in neuroscience. Just to give you an example, there's more than 100,000 neuroscience paper published every year. Nobody can digest them. Can you, through a computer, integrate them 
and try to simulate the data. This is fine, and there was a very interesting cell paper published this year. But the most interesting thing is that we might be able to, in fact, also change the way chips are going to be created in the coming decades, what we call design chips based on understanding of how the brain computes. So I think we can expect smarter chips for the next generation of robots. That means we're going to put much more intelligence in the devices that we're going to create. And of course, this you say, is it accessible? So when you talk about internet, we say it's the, you know, not the very few, because three billion is a lot. But certainly Google and Facebook are working on it. So we can expect, for example, broadband to rural and remote areas. So just, you know, probably have heard about the Google Loon project, which is a flight, uh, a fleet of high altitude balloons, stratospheric drones project, and so on. So we can expect that the next decade, everybody will be connected. So this is, again, some, a new component to think that everybody on this earth will be connected. It, again, has never happened in, in mankind. Now, the good part is we can also access you know, data and also promote education. And you probably have heard about this massive open online courses, those famous MOOCs. EPF had got uh, involved very early on. And, but going back to why are we talking, why is this coming massive? because of the tablets. You know, instead of being in front of a computer, you could be in an airport, whatever. Broad bandwidth, you can watch videos. Cloud computing, the data is just available. Social networks, you can interact with the uh, peers. And of course, something we should never forget is the digital generation. You know, I always say, I'm being a neuroscientist, the brain adapts, adapts fast. Now, we don't know if, it's, if the brain is going to be able to adapt as fast as we produce new technologies. That again, this is one of the uh, uh, challenge. But now just to give you an example of those MOOCs, we've started, this was created in May 2012 at, at, at Stanford, you know, in the Bay. And um, I was there just by chance and I thought something was happening. I was very skeptical, in fact, for years about this online education. Not, I knew it would come, but we didn't have the technology. We were not at the inflection point. I thought something was happening. So I've, we've convinced this, one of our faculty called Marta Odeski. And we're not going into the detail because he's one of our faculty that works on Scala. And, and Scala is a programming, very advanced programming language. It's, by the way, the program that runs Twitter or Amazon. So now if you want to learn how to program in Scala, why don't you learn from the father of Scala, who, by the way, is one of our professors, instead of having this, somebody that learned from somebody that's learned from somebody. So we put the, 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 you know, the course online, and we got 50,000 students registering. But more important, 10,000 took the final exam. Now, this is more, for an academic, is more than probably your entire life. And maybe Philip has more, but I have less. So, so you know, 10,000 is, is, is just enormous. So we thought that something was changing. So we went on, on and, and further developed it. So today, we have 47 MOOCs, 40 in preparation. We start in September. So if you look from September 2012 to March 2016, we have registered close to 1.2 million students in 186 countries. Now, if you talk about being global, this is, we recruit now about as many students per week online that we have on campus. So we have two schools, the physical school and the online school. Now, we have to learn how to mix them, how to interact them. But certainly, in terms of branding, this is quite unique. Now, interestingly, 66% of the students are not students. They're really continuing education students. And, and you can see that 78 have full and employed full time. So it showed that this online, this continuous education will become something extremely important for society. Now, you see that we've started now to give statement of accomplishment, kind of little diplomas, and we will go to what we call nano degrees, micro degrees, and so on. But we give as many credits, even now, online, that we give on campus. So again, showing that this has become, that you can see how this evolves. Now, as we're a bilingual school, French, English, half of our course, more or less, uh, rest in French, half of the, and English, and you could see, I was surprised that one third of our students would take the course in French. I think this is kind of encouraging. I wouldn't expect it, to be honest. Uh, but now, interestingly, where do they come from? So it depends. Well, you could see English MOOCs or French MOOCs. If you look just at the French MOOCs, you look at the uh, dark uh, black, 19% come from Africa. 
And I think for me, this is the demonstration to some extent that if you provide the tools, I would say the most democratic thing that I know in life is DNA. And we all receive the same. So I think if you water it and you give an access, you know, there's no reason to believe that we're smarter than others. And I think this is probably the biggest tool. So now you can see where are students? Now this is interesting. Before I thought it was Swiss Roman, Swiss Allemand, maybe in Europe and so on. Immediately they're around. So you could see in the US, in, in India, of course in Europe, in Brazil and so on. Now you could say in Africa it's not that many. However, I found this interesting what you see in the western court there. You see the French part, you could see. But now you look at how many students per number of inter uh, IP address per country. This is the, the image that you get. So you see what I say is, where is the thirst for education? And again, this is an incredible tool that we can provide. And I will not go into the detail, we do this together. We invite our African colleagues to come, to register. They can be online with their own course. We work together and so on. So I think this is capability to, in fact, interact, which is quite unique. And I think this is the, uh, I would say, reassuring thing about the world. Also, you can tailor courses. And I'll give you just two examples. The first one we did at EBFL is called Launching New Ventures. How do you make a startup in developing countries? How do you access microfinance? Because it's not only the course, but you have people around the course. And of course, people can access. So we see now new ventures and access to microfinancing through those courses. This is something unique. University of Geneva has done one on, uh, for example, Ebola, very quickly providing for the people uh, on the terrain. So you can also act very rapidly, much more than before, with a classical way. So that's the digital. Now let me just change to another subject, which is also, I think, fascinating which is the robotics. And that's, I would say, the same thing. We've spoken, we've seen robots, specifically coming from Japan. We didn't think that there would be the people who would like to share our life. But here, again, we see massive advance in robotics. Certainly on the mechanical part, but also in the amount of intelligence that you can put in the robots. The other part is the what we call additive manufacturing, the capability to build objects and not going through the classical way, but really from the design and have machines creating objects for you. And I think this will have a huge impact on jobs, specifically for unqualified people. So the jury is still out. Are you creating new you know, needs? Is that sufficient? Or are you going to just uh, change the balance? Transportation, and we see it, will rely more and more on autonomous vehicles. The cars, for example, the Google car are ready. However, it's more the legislation. So often we will have a discrepancy between the technology and the legislation, which is miles away. Potentially having planes, you know, automatically flown planes is, very, is potentially technically feasible. Now, are we ready to enter a plane with no pilot? This is something that, you know, for us conceptually, even though they would probably be safer, a more dangerous world as a consequence of the development of smart weapons, and I don't have to tell you today, but certainly in drones, robots, and so on, this is also coming. So the rise of robots, increased affordability. Just to give you a C mode, which was one of the most advanced developed robot created by Honda and so on, 150,000. Today, the Luna that does about the same thing is around, you know, one to three thousand dollar. Tomorrow there will be commodities in the hundreds, doing a lot of things. So the markets are going up, as you can see. Uh, the prediction is by 2020, they will be close to 20 billion. Now, what are they going to do? Elderly care, assisted living, household care, companionship. But I think you know, they're, getting, they're getting smarter and smarter. So I think they're going to be able to do it now. The question is, how are we going to accept them? How are we going to interact with them? Now, of course, if you're an aging society in Japan, with an impossibility to get people in immigration, maybe, and that's maybe one of the reasons why Japan is so advanced. But certainly we will have to play with this occasion. Advances in drone technology, also very clearly, we know it from the military use, but I think they get smaller and even more you know, accessible. Now we see also the security issues that are coming out of it, but you can see that very sophisticated drones can be bought for very reasonable prices that were unthinkable 
to be honest, even five years ago. And not only for military use, you know, a lot of things do not know. The Achlemanic, but more on the Lausanne side, is a drone valley. And there's about now close of count close to ten companies doing the most sophisticated drone. Now it's not the flying, but it's the information, it's the data that you collect. For example, agriculture and so on will be very much now controlled by those kind of devices. Now, at which level should they be? Should they be at the stratospheric, at the underlevel? All this is debatable. But they kind of hyperspectral camera that we can mount on them and so on will have, for example, huge impact on several things, but, for example, in agriculture. So we're seeing now clusters of technology, uh, uh, in, even in this, in this region. There are a couple of, one project that I tend to like that was developed at EPFL between uh, Jonathan Ledgar and Norman Foster, the architect, speaking about uh, a drone port in Africa, knowing that roads in remote areas are difficult to access, can we create a new system of transportation? Now, it would have been unthinkable because of the price, but the price is uh, having autonomous unmanned aircraft carrying, for example, you know, a load of 10 kilo is affordable. Now, should Africa, and they're doing already in terms of information technology, uh, you can see that you know, our African colleagues are very much connected. Can you go in terms of transportation? It would be very difficult for our society because we've put an enormous amount of uh, 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 resources in the great infrastructure. But this is not the case, for example, in Africa. And I'll finish <coughs> with the thing that I think is going to impact even more so. It's this Bajga revolution. So it has many aspects, but first I think we have to be prepared for an aging society as a consequence of development of medical technologies, but also a world where humans will live longer in good health, but at a price. And the major one is the dementia epidemics. And for now, we haven't found the way. There are interesting things, but I don't think in the short term we will see it. So that's going to have an impact on society, which is going to be phenomenal but also a world that will have to adapt to two new technologies. One is gene editing, which is accessible, and the other one is the definition of self. What are we? Can we start to think about augmentation technologies? So you know those, those uh, graphs. Certainly there is a, a significant increase of life expectancy in the developed countries, but also in developing countries. For example, China, with a one-child policy, has a major issue of aging as a society. And this is not often seen. Now, why are we? The hygiene was the first wave, but the second one, to get from 70 to 100, it's going to be probably more technology. And we have prosthesis and implants for everything, you know, spare part, what I call spare part uh, medicine. If you look at the heart, we can replace nearly anything. Before, with a, it was quite invasive, it becomes less and less invasive. But also, artificial retina, hearing aids, sphincter, DBS, what we call deep brain stimulation, and so on. So spare parts medicine, except for one, the brain. So I think the dementia and, and the risk for society to have people walking and functioning but not thinking is quite large, at least in the decades to come, and not a very reassuring one. Now, personalized health is certainly the other big uh, thing that will come in medicine, and that's also linked to our, bi our ability, for example, to see sequence our genome. Just, you know, we always speak about the Moore's law that says that we augment the capacity of chips every 12, we double every 18 months. Just to say the capacity to sequence has broken the Moore's law. We have never seen in the history of mankind a technology, you know, developing so fast. So the first genome 20 or 25 years ago cost about 3 billion. We're about close to 1,000 per genome. Probably in the next 5 to 10 years it'll be 100 Swiss francs to sequence a full human genome, which is, who would have thought that sequencing a human, a human genome is a commodity? Now, what are we going to do with all this data? Can we identify predisposing genes and risk factors, tailored pre uh, prevention program, lifestyle, nutrition, drugs? But we know we'll have more and more biosensors, watches, glasses, contact lens, clothes, and so on, sensing us you know, and, and, and recording those parameters and data. And probably a lot of us are doing it already today. Now, we're in the infancy, but tomorrow those will be implanted. 
That's what we call digital medicine or the quantified self. So we'll have more and more, and you could see also this convergence, not only on technology, but from the business standpoint. You will see the GAFA, that means the, the Googles, the Facebooks, and so on, integrating some of this, because it's the data that is the real business, with the, you know, the Medtronics, the Roches, the Novartis. And I think this is something absolutely fascinating. So welcome to the medical big data world. Now, what's the consequence, of course? Behavior-based insurance premium. If you walk a lot, you know, can you decrease your premium and so on? But that means you would agree to share your personal data, measurement of drug compliancy. But again, the privacy issue is the key one that we will have to cope. Another thing is the new definition of self. With all those devices, we will, we will go beyond what we are. And it could be done through devices that, can, that will sense beyond our bodies, also by changing our genetic code. And I think this is something extraordinary. Now you can say, why should we do this? But one of our faculty, Olaf Blanquet, works on something fascinating called cognoceuticals. If virtual reality becomes that you don't go with something huge like this, but normal glasses, you know, your brain analyzes what you give. So the brain will think that the, that's the reality that you give him is, in fact, your virtual reality. So he has a great example where you know, he, he puts, he, he has somebody that is an amputee and has those, those uh, phantom pain. He can modify, in fact, the realization of the brain by making the person think that they have the arm that they don't have. So you trick the brain by giving inputs to your brain. And I think those are very amenable. And they do not come from the pharma. They come from the technical you know, world, from the nano, from the info world. Now, the bio world has done something. So I don't know, how many of you have heard about the CRISP-Cas9? OK. I think this is probably the biggest revolution in, in, in biology that we see. Came from very basic understanding of how bacteria function. And this is, uh, on the right, last week's nature cover. Nature is our Bible, science and nature. It shows that, and we will not go into the detail of what it is, but you know, just to be sure that you know, it's called clustered regulatory interspace short palindromic repeats. So I will not go too long, uh, too deep in this, but simply, it's a way that you can target a gene very easily, because there's an RNA a guide mechanism, and you can change very easily the genome. Correct it, and you can correct, in fact, errors in the genome very precisely to do either gene activation or gene repair. And this is a very simple technology from a molecular bio biology point. And it can have huge impacts on life. So certainly on synthetic biology, you could envision creating biofuels, polymers, and so on. On agriculture, crops, animals, eradicating, for example, malaria by, doing, uh, uh, by editing uh, um, the anophels and so on. But the key central thing is what about the human being? And as you know that we have a lot of stem cell technology, so you could go back and you can gene edit uh, the stem cells, or even further, the germline cells, the ones that are rep responsible for our reproduction. Now, what can you do with them? You could, for example, eliminate disease alleles from population. Cystic fibrosis can be eliminated by this technology, at least in a family, or Huntington disease. So probably we would all agree to do this. And those rare Mendelian disease, we would all agree. Now, how far can you go? Should you reduce disease risk? Are you ready to change your genome so that you would be protected from cancer, heart disease? Or <coughs> the next step, are we ready to enhance the human population? So let me just give you examples, which are rather simple conceptually. You can introduce in our genome uh, enzymes to digest cellulose. Now, we would be like cows, but you would increase now, uh, you know, nutrition very significantly if we could metabolize. Or you could, you know, put retinal receptors for infrared vision so we could start to see at night. Those are just a couple of examples, and they're not science fiction. They're at the tip of our hands. 
Now, desire, tread, perfect pitch, height, muscle, mass, blue eyes, you name it. But I think this, you know, we, we, we understand. But, you know, can we go to change our metabolism, see other things, and so on? That's the first time, obviously, mankind will have those possibilities. Now, fortunately for now, there is an idea of a, a moratorium. So the International Summit on Human Gene Editing that uh, met in December 2015 decided, which I think is an interesting thing, he said it would be irresponsible to proceed with any clinical use germ editing today. However, as scientific knowledge advances and social views evolve, the clinical use of germline editing should be revisited, revisited on a regular basis. So this is a bit of the epidamocles on our head. Are we ready or not to go down that path? Interestingly, I was last month with the editor-in-chief of Nature that said that he had turned down that several papers done by some Chinese colleagues. He said that the data of the science was perfect, but it was gene germline editing on human cells. Are we ready to go down that path? I don't think that we even have to decide. I think it will happen. And this is of great concern. Now, the other thing is you can see that the regulation, worldwide regulation, is very dispersed. Some countries have a ban by, by legislation, by guidelines, restrictive, ambiguous. And you see, for example, that China is ambiguous. And of course, the technology, you do not need very advanced technology once you have it. This is what it is. You know, I always say to make a nuclear bomb requires a lot of technologies, monitoring, and so on. This doesn't. So we can also imagine the development of new bioweapons. And I like this picture saying, you know, uh, Ori Gene Chris Gene Knockout Kit. You can just buy it. So you don't need there's any nothing that protects it today. So the consequence of that is potentially, of course, you know, the poor man's bomb and, and so on. And what do we see what's happening in the world? You would be concerned. So, I'll finish just with this thing that, you know, all this is okay, this is ahead of us, but behind us is the heritage of the Industrial Revolution. And certainly, I will not dwell on it, you know the thing, the climate change that will displace hundreds of millions, billion, we don't know, a planet of migrants. <coughs> I think we have to be ready for that. And if we think what we're seeing today is important, now, think about if we don't do something for continent like Africa, if they do not develop their capabilities. A potential shortage of food and water already during the century, and also a world that we desperately need to find new sources of energy. And there, that's, I think, interesting just conceptually. As much as you could go very fast on the IT, on the biotech, you could not go fast on the energy. And this is you know, something that we have a hard time to cope with. So all those kind of things that I'm putting there are long-term. There's no shortcut. And that's really one of the things. You know, scarcity of water, pollution of air, ecosystem transformation, change in atmospheric and ocean chemistry, melting of glaciers and ice caps and so on. Those are slow, long-term changes that we will have to cope with. And we know the Anthropocene energy problematic you can see you know, how much we were consuming versus the population. You see that we're passing. Where are we going to be in 2025? And there, the news is not good. In the sense that always saying, you know, people, and I've met a lot of politicians say, you know, science is so powerful, you will find a way. But you don't change the law of thermodynamics. And, and I think this is something that we have to keep. So there's an urgent need for technical and probably societal breakthroughs. But there's no ease technological breakthroughs in those. And I think we have really a brain that has a hard time to, on one side, accept those you know, extraordinarily fast uh, progress on one side, or evolution, and this kind of slow keep on the impact. So I'll finish there to say, this is the view from the science, from you know, somebody that heads what I think is a great school, but I'm a bit biased there. But also, as you know, we went close by. So, and I, I think this city has a lot to offer. We say, we say the three I's, international, innovation, impact. 
So the good news is that there's an opportunity to collaborate as EPFL become neighbor of the Graduate Institute. And this is something new. I think we need to have impact-oriented innovation that requires technology, but also social science and diplomacy. I think we have to work on the policy issues. So on one side, the policy people could not ignore science. And we as scientists could not ignore policy. But we have to learn how to talk to each other. And that's a, it's not an easy task. So, but I think this city is the place, and this neighborhood is probably the place. And we say La Genève Internationale must remain the place where the common future of humanity is discussed. And I think we have great institutions like the Graduate Institute, the University of Geneva, IPFL, together can, can contribute to discussion, to, to discussion by creating what I would say a high level interface between the international organization that are based uh, in this town and our own institutions, what I would call the Geneva Initiative. And my dream is to have a global campus, not only now, because we have the tools now with these online MOOCs and so on to you know, distribute not only with one paper, one book, and so on, but the leverage of online education and online technologies is such that I would love to, for example, to have a series of joint MOOCs, I would call it the Geneva School of Thought. I'm always amazed when I'm at the WEF to see how much our US friends are present in terms of policy, the Kennedy School, and so on. I don't hear the voice of Europe. And I think Europe needs to get its act together and be more present on the international scene because our way of perceiving the world is also very much influenced by culture. And I could give you a couple of <coughs> themes. Those are just, you know, keep, like internet governance, certainly. Internet dispute resolution governance, big data access and control, privacy protection, you name it. On the impact of brain science, brain-machine interface, I didn't go too much into, the, into neuroscience, but it's thinkable that you could read in somebody's mind in a decade or two. What would you do if you could do that? And I think w w the problem we have, we never anticipate sufficiently. Now, it looks like, you know, uh, uh, spooky and Frankenstein, but I tell you, the pace of science is such that those things are thinkable. I'm not saying that they are there today, but I think we should learn how to anticipate the technological breakthroughs. And for example, guidelines more down to earth of drawing deployment. So there's a couple of things that I think we could do. Now you could say, we've known each other, we said we would do, but I think I'll finish with uh, a great quotation from Rudy uh, Dornbusch from MIT that said something that I love. He said, things take longer to happen than you think they will, and then they happen faster than you thought they could. And I think that's the kind of thing I would put my mind in. So we can apply it to a lot of different things in life, but I think we should learn how to work together because the world is exciting on one side, but also worrisome on the other. And it is up, and science has to get more involved. It cannot just evolve like this without asking the utility. So, you know, it, it, there is something that nobody can repress in man, is a desire to know more. Not a single regime in the world has been able and will ever be. However, the science becomes so sensitive of what we are that we cannot afford not to work on it. Thank you for your attention. <clears throat> Many thanks. So the floor is open for questions. Please uh, give your name and uh, ask short questions. My name is Howard Hornfeld. Uh, I am also an MIT person, and I believe very much in the Dornbush uh, um, quotation you put up there. One thing that was really missing, I think, from your talk, 
is the fact that we need electricity for virtually everything we talked about. And if you look at the world today, 15% of the world has never seen any electricity at all. And if, say, in 20 years' time, one-third of those people start to use electricity, that's the entire population of the U.S. as new consumers. Number two, there are about as many people, more than 1.1 billion people, who live in urban poverty. If, again, one-third of those people start to use electricity in the next 20 years, that's another population of the U.S. as new consumers, and on and on. My point being that we need a, a better source of electricity because electricity is the basis for virtually all the changes that you have spoken about, and of course the rest of the world is talking the same thing. And of course at the EPFL there is a process in uh, operation right now at the TCV in the uh, former CRPP, which is now this, uh, the Swiss Plasma Center, for fusion energy. Fusion energy is for me the only future that we can have. And fusion can be, as Mr. Dornbus just said, Things take a long time to happen, and then they start to happen very fast. And we are now at the stage where I believe we should have fusion energy being developed now much more rapidly than we have up until now. It's taken 50 years to get to the point where we are now. I say that today we can make fusion electricity. My little operation is called Fusion Advocates, as you might be, and I'm trying to push that. Do you have any comments? No, no, it's, you know, fusion is probably the only way to provide long-term, sustainable, clean electricity. We all agree. The problem is it has been a moving target, as you know. And we've, our scientists have always, you know, told us that it, it needs 30 years investment. But that has been true for the last 50 years. So if you talk to me about 2030, I don't think that we will have electric based on fusion. So, so, but I've talked, you know, I'm not a specialist, but I talk even to our people, our specialists, and they tell me, hopefully ITER will go and we can show for once that we could put more energy, that, that we produce more energy than we put in. But on, on a real, you know, deployment, I think it's going to be more the 22nd century than the 21st. I hope I'm wrong, but all my scientists and the specialists tell me that this will be the case, even the most optimistic. So, so, but I agree that this is probably the only long-term solution to electricity. Now, just as a, I agree with you, but at the same time, I spent six months, you know, going and, and going in, in and traveling in Africa and so on. And I was amazed, I remember always in Tanzania, in the bush, in a village where there was no electricity, no water, but they had iPads. <laughs> And, and, and the most important thing, you know, how they were charging their iPad is, no, it's just, you know, solar cells. So, you know, it depends what you, when, if you need energy to move or you need energy to connect. And I think in this regard, you know, and I've spoken to a lot of people, the most important thing for them was access to the cell phone. It's a lifeline, security, payment, and so on. And for those kind of applications, you don't need a lot of energy. And again, the kind of solutions we have today are accessible. Thank you. <clears throat> Janusz Pastor, my name. Uh, you spoke uh, quite a lot about the advances in uh, sciences, in natural sciences in particular. And you mentioned a couple of times that we need to catch up from the social political perspective, but you didn't give us too many uh, leads on how we might be able to do that. Yet, all of these things will require that. And, and just give you one example from your own talk. You mentioned a couple of times Google. Google is behind some of the most amazing developments. It's one company. Who is controlling Google? Yeah, I think, and I think the debate today with Apple and FBI is an interesting one, uh, even more so. Uh, because there we have a very concrete, uh, you know, example. But, you know, it's, it's certainly, and I think the, the, the consequence of the technology, what I'm just saying, I was asked to say, where do you see technology going? <laughs> of course, as an individual, I have some thoughts and so on. But I think what I'm just saying, we will have to have the, the governance, to some extent, of the progress of science has to be 
put in place soon because I'm concerned about the pace at which science comes and the time. When I'm saying about you know, the, the, the time of infrastructure, because this is physical, but I'm always amazed that the time of social sciences is so long. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the kind of things we should learn is much more anticipate. But for this, you, we need as scientists to be more literate in the humanities and social science. But what strikes me also today is the illiterism of the general population in science. And I think you need, and we need to bridge again more. It's, you know, it's not rocket science to understand what is coming, not in the detail, but what is coming you know, down the road is understandable, probably by a lot of people. So I think we have to create those new places where those kind of things, and those new way to debate, to discuss. And I don't think that the governments are able, because the time for government is too long mm -hmm. uh, to some extent. So I'm just saying, and that's why, going back to the Geneva and so on, and what should Geneva do in the 21st century, I think this is one of the rare places where a lot of the actors are present. It was lacking, to some extent, technology. So symbolically, by us coming here, it's a link to technology. It's interesting, so just to take New York City, you know, Mayor Bloomberg, when he was a mayor, has, you know, put uh, uh, a call to create a new institute of technology in New York, saying you need to have those because technology is changing society such as a fast pace, pace that you need to get this interface. And I think the problem we have, we are educated in silos. And if we don't break those silos, we will have a hard time to talk and to interact. And again, coming back to anticipate. Hello, I'm Conrad Seifert. Um, yeah, you said that we cannot afford not to research. And I agree completely with that, but then the question is, shouldn't we maybe reallocate funding in a way that um, we, the, the security research outpaces general research that may actually currently be too enthusiastic about developments such as AI and general intelligence and the internet of everything that might pose more threats or is there other ways of um, yeah, doing more security research other than reallocating funding and maybe advocating more actively for it because you didn't really mention that in your talk either. No, but I think, <coughs> sorry, one thing that strikes me also is today technology is being seen as a way to ensure your own de economic development. So I love the, de you know, if you take China and so on, put, are putting a massive amount of resources to kind of catch up. I do remember it was what, four or five years ago in Beijing for the 100th anniversary of Tsinghua, which is the technical university. And the premier at the time saying, today China is the l'usine du monde and tomorrow it will be the engine of the world. So the, the kind of, you know, uh, relation, it's so much, at the time, you know, the pure discovery was not necessarily linked to its utilization and commercialization so on. The time between the discovery and, that's a, in a, and its application is also getting you know, shorter. So it's impossible to say, you know, and I think mankind will continue to do this disruptive discovery because we want to know. I always say, you know, there's two things that we really want to continue to know is how from this yogurt that we have in, this, in our head, we become conscious individuals and where are we in this universe? So I say neuroscience and cosmology are the thing that nobody can you know, prevent you because that's part of our anxiety to know more. So this kind of basic discovery, blue sky, will continue. And for example, if you take a crisp technology, it's not somebody that thought that they want to do some gene editing of human germline. She was, you know, the, this two lady, you know, they were just fascinated about some very peculiar way how, you know, genes are read and cut and interpreted in bacteria. And suddenly they discover something 
that has a huge potential application. So it is <coughs> really in the application that we have to come with ways to suit. You cannot prevent people to want to know more, but I think you can control the way people apply the discovery of mankind. But it's going to get more and more difficult because it's much more spread and there are many more people with different cultures working on those kind of things. And the access of high-tech technology is broader that, you know, than it was 100 years ago. You have many more players with different cultures. Francis Waldvogel. <coughs> Francis Waldvogel. Uh, Patrick, many thanks for a very inspiring talk. Uh, let's assume that half of what you said will be achieved by 1930, just half of it. Um, do you think uh, we might not be missing uh, some of the, of the high priorities of our civilization today, which is essentially the democratic system and alleviating poverty? In other terms, isn't there some kind of a, an immediate a necessity at the present time to reallocate the funds and reallocate some of our research for the real pressing problems of our civilization? Yeah, but as an individual, of course I would say yes. But I, my, my purpose was not this. It's, I'm just saying science is going on. It's so fast. Mm -hmm. And people will continue. So I think, yes, we have to think about this. It's fundamental and it has never been as important. But now, I'll give you an example. I think, you know, there are issues about digital revolution. I'm not sure that MOOCs is the ultimate, but the fact that you could start now, you know, democracy and also, I think, is access to knowledge also. This is probably one of the most important. Now, if everybody would have an access, you would say that's fantastic. But let's not be naive. Access to knowledge and so on does not necessarily say that you're going to use it wisely. So, you know, we always have this internal contradiction, which is much more a philosophical question, is how. What I'm, the only thing I'm saying is the humanity has never been exposed to so many new transforming technologies that can even go at the heart of what we are. And I don't think that we have the governance systems in place to learn how to use them. And, you know, that's where, and I think this town should really think about it. And we have the tools, and it has to come somewhere. And I think to some extent, Europe is a great place because of all our history and so on, and the diversity and so on. And I think we need to get the European you know, voice be heard. Because you know, I, I have a lot of Chinese friends, but their view of the world is different. Their philosophy is different. Their ethics are different. And this is, you know, we don't have a common way to the old decide, but we need to, because the tools that we have in our hand are extremely powerful. They can be used to the good, but they can also be used for the bad. And the question is, how do we put control? And I think we have a discrepancy of the speed. And that's what I'm saying of what we discover and the potential thing we can do it with a civil society that doesn't have the tools to follow the speed of scientific discoveries. Hello. Uh, so for the year 2030, uh, especially in Geneva with the humanitarian and development communities here, this is a big year with the SDGs and the post-2015 agenda, and you talked a bit about the applications of science and technology in improving, similarly to the, what the gentleman before me said, these types of uh, major global issues that we're facing at the current time. How do we, being in Geneva, where we have all of these actors that you're talking about, how do we kickstart the relationship between the technology sector, the, how, the humanitarian sector, and these longer-term development issues in order to have real, actualized progress by the 2030? Here. Yeah. <coughs> Sorry, I think it's a very good question. And I think, you know, that's why I'm saying that something unique could be made in this in this town because we have all those international organizations, we have the Médecins Sans Frontières, CICR, and you name it. We also, I think I've sensed a great interest of those, uh, those organizations to see how innovation 
can be you know, implemented in their way of doing things. But at the same time, you have people that have not been exposed really to those. And I think we have, that's how I think we have to bring all those you know, multi-stakeholders together. And I think that's where Geneva can offer something quite unique. I would say with my friends in MIT and Harvard, not, they don't have those organizations in their backyard. Now, for reasons that, you know, are, are those, uh, we have not interacted a lot with those organizations. I think, again, yeah, those organizations live with their own ways, with their own, you know, uh, 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 behaviors and so on. And we did. And I think it is time to try to put all those people together. And I think there's something absolutely unique about this. Something unique can be done. And I think that academic institutions, I'm probably a bit biased there, have the people because we don't have a direct interest, commercial interest, you name it. But I think it's up to us first to work together and to work with those organizations that are really demanding, at least now. All this is easy, but to do it practically it takes time, and we have to learn each other's language, each other's jargon, uh, uh, which will take. But I think there's an urgency at least to start this dialogue. Hello, hi. My name is Anissa Aliahia, and I have a question regarding, or perhaps a reflection regarding the personal genomics. So when the Human Genome Project started, the prediction was that humans would um, have about more than 100,000 genes. And one of the biggest surprise that came out of the project was that we only have 20,000 genes, uh, which is sometimes less than primitive organisms. So that was a huge surprise. And, and this called uh, many things into question. It suggests that the human genome is actually more, uh, there's something about regulation, that it is really the regulation of the genes rather than the genes themselves that are that could predict perhaps disease risk. And, and I'm, I was just wondering what you thought because epigenetics and the interaction of the genes and the environment, I think, is one of the biggest frontiers um, we will probably have to go through. And, and I think it will reveal a lot of things that personal genomics, just identifying genes itself, will not t reveal. No, I, I agree. And, you know, <coughs> It's, it was a surprise to think that we didn't have more genes than the, than the little worms, the elegans, or the mauvaise herbe. Which, but the way we have a lot of what we call as you know junk DNA, about only two percent of our genome encodes for proteins and so on. And what we thought was uh, junk DNA is probably much less junk than we think. And now I think, and I see we're not going to do it, but we see a lot of interaction of the. Of the, the hundreds and you know, millions of years that we've accumulated specifically from the viruses, but also all the aspect of epigenetics. So yes, we are a complex machine that we're far from understanding because we could just read you know, uh, uh, the, the genome. We can read, but we do not understand a lot. It's like you know, you could, I could read Greek, but I don't understand Greek. So we're about this level. Now, this is a bit exaggerated because there's a lot of genes that we know and so on, and we can relate to disease. But certainly, the next step will be to try to, to, to understand, you know, uh, 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 how the genes. But that's again, to come back to big data, we didn't have the, neither the tools. Just here, we're going to open a genome center where we've planned to, to do full sequence, more or less, of 10,000 human genomes. The U.S. has decided to sequence one million American. But now, you know, this is, you know, what, this one million Americans, something like this, one million, and tomorrow it will be everybody. So the more you do, again, going back to, to, to deep learning, the more you do, the more you learn. So we have the capability on one side to do, you know, sequencing at a very high level, but also with big data to try to understand, you know, and better. So my impression, we will know much more in the decades to come of how you know this whole system works, uh, uh, and hopefully you know, of course, we'll prevent disease and so on. But at the same time, you know, we will have to know what are we going to do with this data, because it impacts what we are. So I'm very confident of our ability to understand how the system works in the decades to come. I'm less confident about the way we're going to want to use it. Uh, hello, thank you very much for the talk. 
Um, I wondered whether you could tell us a bit more about whether you think the benefits will outweigh the risks of these advances. So to name but a few, there's the potential for rogue artificial intelligence, the power of biotechnology in the hands of anybody, and the potential of ultra-intelligent, genetically modified humans as oppressors of the rest of the population. And perhaps, I guess, as a metric for um, judging this, I wonder what your assessment of the probability of uh, the human race surviving the 21st century is. The, the, Thank you. I didn't get the last part, sorry. Um, I wonder if you could uh, assess the probability of uh, humankind surviving the 21st century. <laughs> I'm not sure I will answer because I'm afraid there's a journalist here and then uh, tomorrow they'll say <laughs> the president of VFL thinks that humanity will be gone, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so I'll keep this for me. <laughs> but no, but the, uh, more, you know, on, on this thing, yes, I think, you know, we w it's no doubt that we will have the capability to do gene augmentation. Now we all have this, this dream to be more intelligent and more... And, and, you know, now that's still a complex issue and I'm not sure that we can do it tomorrow. We can do simple things. We will do simple things with gene augmentation. Like, you know, seeing infrared and so on. Those are very conceivable. When you call, talk about intelligence, it's always our dream. But I, I wonder, you know, to which extent do we want to be more intelligent? Uh, um, you know, is that linked to, to happiness and so on? I'm not sure. You know, there's this myth about two things, about intelligent and, and eternity. I think it's pretty frightening, you know, when you look at it. Uh, um, so, yeah, we go to, to very specific and personal question, but, you know, what is fascinating is that we start, you know, we have the capability to one side, on one side, to try to understand what we are, how do we become a conscious individual, you know, I always think give this example. Can, can we crack the code of consciousness? You know, it's interesting. Like, hundred years ago, people didn't think that we could crack the code of heredity because you always have a hard time to believe that something that you think is unthinkable today will be think will be feasible tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I would say that you would be sure, but I could not certify today that we will not be able one day to crack the code of consciousness. That's as far as I would go. So, and the second thing I'm much more s certain, we, ha we will, today already, but we will have the capability to enhance, technically, the human being. Are we willing to do this is a different issue. And that's where society needs to get involved pretty quickly. Because the technical, what we thought there would take you know, decades, is at the tip of our finger. And that's where I'm going back to, we need, you know, evidence-based policy that works on those issues, ASAP. Um, hello, up here, in the corner, other corner. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> uh, my name is Diana Esteves, I work in the World Health Organization and Nutrition. And I really liked your, your talk, but then I also think that science and technology has to focus a little bit more in what are the priorities of funding and investment. I read an article about a group of science, probably Harvard, <laughs> that uh, developed a hamburger uh, in order to uh, have alternatives of uh, meat and uh, other foods. And the development of this one hamburger uh, of artificial meat was $500,000. And if the, if the goal is to reduce or to tackle hunger in the world, I, as, a, as a public health uh, aspect, I was thinking, how many children could have been fed with that money in order that was used to develop this? So it's very interesting to have technology in the, in the, in the front because we are all super curious and all the things that people can do. But uh, what, what is the priority for Yeah, but we, we come always to, to the utilization, you know, which it's a question we have to do. But at the same time, you know, you could not ask scientists to do what you would like them to do. Okay? You have something called basic science. 
And a lot of the advancements that we saw are the results of pure interest to know and how things work. Let me just give you an example about nutrition. Who would have thought that the billions of cells that you have in your guts, what we call your gut microbiome, would have you know, influenced so much what we are and the disease we're exposed to? You could never say, why suddenly this happened? Because we went into sequencing, then we realized, and then we have the capability to sequence and so on, and then we discover applications. But mankind has never, and the society that have tried to control science, to my extent, or to the little history that I know, have failed. And, and again, because this is irrepressible, we, can, we always confused the desire to know more which is at the root of science with the application of what science does. So yes, I agree on nutrition, we should have this, yes, it is, but this is not science, okay? This is application, this is policy, this is this new world. But what I'm just saying is while we are incapable to find those, eh, science continues at a speed that it has never seen before. Mm. And what you think is problematic today, let me tell you, is much more worrisome tomorrow. Because nobody can say to scientists, stop to do science in this area. There are a couple of areas, you know, by, and even there, they have been passed. So you can have moratoriums. For example, there is a more, there is an idea of moratorium on artificial intelligence. There have been one at the heart, at the beginning of molecular biology, but moratorium are not a long-term solution. So scientists now start to come with the desire to think, to put boundaries, because we start to realize that we're working on things that are so profound you know, deficient in what we are and what we could do with it, but it has to go beyond science. Society has to get. But again, let's not, the, let's not confuse the scientific progress and the discovery and disruptive, and anybody in his, you know, little garden can make a fantastic discovery. You could not prevent mankind to think, but you could probably ask to apply things in a reasonable way. At least society can try to have some boundaries. But let's not think one second that you could stop the desire of mankind to know more. Thank you very, very much. My name is Barbara Woods uh, from Global Development. This was an excellent and very inspiring uh, presentation. I would like to touch uh, on human collaboration, which you mentioned so many times again and again. And um, I think the conversation today is an extraordinary example of EPFL collaborating with Graduate Institute, which is in itself an excellent seat to take this dialogue forward. So I, my question to you is, uh, are two questions. One is, what have you seen in sharing with us all these four trends? What kind of trends in human collaboration have you seen? And secondly, how we can um, utilize these trends and bring them to Geneva and build on the seed that you planted today? Thank you. It's a tough question, but collaborate. I think we need, you know, science, by the way, evolves often through collaboration, you know. You never make a discovery by yourself. I think it's new, you know, of course it's Einstein and Newton said that you always rise on the shoulder of your predecessor. And I always think that science evolves by really very deep collaboration. I always compare science as ants. Scientists were ants. We walk, but it's a collective you know, aspect. So yes, we think. I always said that if Einstein didn't live, it would have taken longer 
to discover the law of relativity, but I think we would have had. So Einstein was an ant that could you know, travel a little faster. But what is important is the collective, and that's why science, you know, we always think, and we give a Nobel Prize to X, to Z, to that, but it's a collective aspect of science that is so impressive. Because in natural science, at least, we share the same language. And this is something that is much more difficult when you go to humanities and to social sciences. You know, the law of physics are the same wherever you are, even in the universe. So the question is always how fast you discover them. And this is a very, very collective process. So science is by nature collaborative. The question is now, what do you do with these discoveries? What do you do? And you know, sometimes we ask Nobel Prizes what they think about, and they're usually very good at what they do, but it's not because they have a Nobel Prize that they're very good at other things. And, and, and so we have this myth about the scientist that should be a wise man. In fact, it's not. <laughs> but it's like everybody else. But I have always been impressed by, and I think you could also ask yourself, why is science so fast now? Because the world has never seen as many scientists. That's something we shouldn't forget. We're so powerful tools. And it's not because you know, we're more intelligent, but we're putting more resources with more brain. So science is a collective brain operation. But the question is going, I'm sorry to hammer again, but the question is, what do you do with our discoveries? The last question over there. So. Yes, I'm George Tolan, ex-ILO, ex-UN, <clears throat> one of these foreigners who's been living in Switzerland for decades. Now, my question is, what preventive or prophylactic measures are you contemplating to ensure that this wonderful idea of creating this international research center in Geneva, you know, with EPFL, uh, uh, HOE, so that the, the 9th February 2014 referendum does not impede the free movement of scientists and researchers. This is my concern, because there's been a lot of uh, debate about this. Now, what, do you, what can you uh, say to that? And I imagine you've already been fighting for, to prevent any sort of blocking of the coming arrival of you know, world-renowned scientists. Thank you. Now, I think it's a very good point. I think, you know, Swiss tend to forget that we are, we have very high reputation in science. We have a lot of, of, of our universities that are, you know, top-class universities, but we are there because we have an open academic system. The day we close them, we will lose them. Okay, and that's probably the biggest threat for Switzerland, for this town, is if we go back and close our borders, we will not be you know, able to contribute as we should. And, and uh, uh, I always say, if I take the example of EPFL, uh, we couldn't do a world-class research university out of the naturel, the bassin naturel of Swiss Romand, which is what, 1.5, if we're generous, uh, uh, French-speaking Swiss. We are there because we can attract the talent. The day we close our borders, we will lose, lose it all. But in this current environment, it's difficult for the people to understand and to share. But I think that's what one of our, I think, major responsibility is to explain to our citizen that this is an absolutely essential thing, is not to be afraid of the outside world if you want to participate and continue to be an open country. We were not born like we are. I always remind my, you know, I'm the last generation where my grandparents told me of a poor Switzerland. My children have a hard time to believe me. I just became a grandfather of twins. They're not to the point where I can talk to them, but I hope soon, and the, probably for them, they will always, the tendency that you, we think that we were born like this. We were not born. We, we just every, we did everything that we could share, and bring the brightest people that we need in this country. 
So I think we have to continue on that path. C'était un très bel exposé, c'était un très beau message aussi, de, une invitation à la collaboration, et, et pour des raisons que nous partageons complètement. Je crois que le domaine des relations internationales, des études de développement, le, les études internationales en général ont besoin de mieux connaître les défis de la science et de la technologie, et, et je crois que des pistes tout à fait sérieuses doivent maintenant être explorées. Donc, un très grand merci à vous, Patrick et Bichard, pour nous avoir euh, rejoints pour cette belle soirée. Merci. merci.